Sense and Sensibility contains a lot of information that can actually allow you to sketch out family trees for the various different characters. I am going to try to map out possibly the most complex families in the entire novel. The Steeles, the Jennings and the Middletons. At the beginning of chapter 11, Mrs Jennings decides to have a day trip to Exeter. She takes Eleanor and Marianne Dashwood along with her. And it is there that they meet Lucy and Anne Steele, two young ladies whom Mrs Jennings had the satisfaction of discovering to be her relations. So these are relations that she has never met before. How exactly are the Steele sisters connected to Mrs Jennings? Initially, it doesn't seem to be very clear. But the response of Mrs Jennings' son-in-law, Sir John Middleton, who wants to welcome everybody and anybody into his social circle, gives us a huge clue. It was painful to him to keep even a third cousin to himself. Is this the clue? And if it is, what exactly is a third cousin? If the Steeles were first cousins to Lady Middleton, his wife, they would share a common set of grandparents. If they are second cousins, they and Lady Middleton have great grandparents in common. So a third cousin means you go back a further generation to make the connection. Somewhere along the line, Lucy and Anne Steele and Lady Middleton have a set of great, great grandparents in common. The novel seems to infer that Lucy and Anne Steele are connected through Mrs Jennings, uh, Lady Middleton's mother. And I think that it's worth trying to map out the immediate family of Mrs Jennings simply because the novel gives so much information her elder daughter Mary, Lady Middleton, is not more than six or seven and twenty. So she's twenty-six, twenty-seven. She is married to John Middleton, a good-looking man about forty. Clearly a bit of an age gap there. We soon learn that they have four noisy children. John is about six. William is described as the second boy and a similar age to Harry Dashwood. That's a bit cryptic but I think he's about four or five. The next child down is Anna Maria, said to be three years old. And finally the one I have to call Unknown Middleton. We don't know whether it's a girl or a boy. We don't know how old they are. But if the eldest child is six and their mother is about 27, this unnamed one has surely got to be a baby or a toddler, which gives us potential to create a three generation tree already. Of course there are also other members of the family, as with the Dashwoods, who we never meet because they have died before the beginning of the novel or they're just not particularly relevant to the plot, but we can work things out about them through the descriptions in the text. Chapter 7 describes Mrs Jennings as an elderly woman. How elderly she can be if her eldest daughter is 26 or 27 is debatable. I would guess 55 to 60. Her late husband had traded with success in a less elegant part of London. John Dashwood, Eleanor and Marianne's half-brother, says that he has heard that Mrs Jennings is the widow of a man who had got all his money in a low way, but I suspect that John Dashwood is being a bit of a snob. Mr Jennings was a tradesman. Trade could mean anything from a well-to-do grocer right up the way to a silk merchant. Chapter 8 confirms that Mr Jennings must have been fairly well off. His wife is described as a widow with ample jointure. 
she had only two daughters, both of whom she had lived to see respectably married. We don't know whether they had any other children. But this clue does tell us something about how the late Mr Jennings provided for his widow and the clue is in the description that she had an ample jointure. Some men left a share of their estates, it would typically be one third, to their wife for her own use for the rest of her life. This could be in the form of money or it could be in the form of property. Often it is also described as a dower, hence you get dower house. In the Jennings case, Mr Jennings arranges a jointure. He settles an estate, some kind of property, on his widow for the rest of her widowhood. Looking closely at the text, I don't think this was their marital home. But since the death of her husband, she had resided every winter in a house in one of the streets near Portman Square in London. And later on in chapter 27, it is suggested that this house is in Barclay Street, which is in Mayfair. This theory is sort of supported by a comment in chapter 26, because when Eleanor and Marianne come to London as the guests of Mrs Jennings, they stay in an apartment, so in a series of rooms within the house that had previously been used by Mrs Jennings' younger daughter, Charlotte, now Mrs Palmer. It does appear that Mr Jennings had probably died before Charlotte's wedding, but I think perhaps after her sister Mary had got married. Various descriptions in this chapter suggest that Charlotte may perhaps have lived in this house at some point. On the wall, is a landscape in coloured silks, probably embroidery silks I think, said to be proof of Charlotte's having spent seven years at a great school in town to some effect. Where Jane Austen is concerned, in town, pretty generally means in London. I would deduce from this that Charlotte and probably also her sister Lady Middleton both seem to have been sent to a school in London somewhere as opposed to being tutored by a governess which is interesting when you compare it to Pride and Prejudice. Mr Jennings seems to be a sort of merchant new money type of person he's not old money like the Dashwoods. The Bingleys are also what you'd call new money, they are self-made people in Pride and Prejudice and Mr Bingley's sisters Caroline and Louisa are also said to have attended one of the first, i.e. one of the best, seminaries, private school, in London. Possibly there is a connection to be made here that the newly moneyed people, the newly rich people, were showing off their wealth a bit by sending their children to private schools, whereas the people with old money would have been sticking to the traditional governess at home for the daughters. But it's an interesting thing to wonder about, I think. And we are told in the novel that Mrs Jennings' daughter Charlotte Palmer was several years younger than Lady Middleton, her sister. So I think Charlotte is probably around about 22 years old, has been married long enough to be pregnant. Charlotte makes a reference to staying with my uncle at Weymouth. I was hoping to pull something out of that for the sake of this video, but unfortunately this seems to be the one and only reference to this uncle in Weymouth. In family history terms I can't really make it amount to very much. Mr Palmer Charlotte's husband is five or six and twenty. And to Lady Middleton's great mortification and embarrassment, when Mrs Jennings brings a Charlotte and Mr Palmer to introduce them to the Dashwoods, Mrs Jennings proceeds to announce that Charlotte expects to be confined in February, and her sister is mortified. This is where we get onto the, the, the nice veiled world of um, 
reproduction and pregnancy in the, the Regency period. And indeed not very much more is really said about Mrs Palmer's pregnancy. Although in chapter 36 this section of the novel opens with the comment The newspapers announce to the world that the lady of Thomas Palmer Esquire was safely delivered of a son and heir. And from the many, many newspaper birth marriages and deaths that I have looked at as part of my own research and research for other people, I will say there are generally very few birth announcements in early newspapers, but what Jane Austen has described here is virtually paraphrasing the standard form of announcement that you would find in a newspaper in the early 19th century. The mother and child are almost always referred to in terms of their relationship to the husband and father. Unlike today, we don't get details like the place of birth, we don't get the weight of the baby, we don't get the name of the baby. We just get who mum and baby are in relation to husband and new dad. Chapter 37 then goes on to tell us that Mrs Palmer was so well at the end of the fortnight that her mother felt it no longer necessary to give up the whole of her time to her. And what this I think is alluding to is that Mrs Palmer would have been in confinement after having her baby. But she would theoretically have been in bed and certainly would not have left the house for around about a month. But the fact that she is well enough at the end of a fortnight suggests that probably being a young mother and fairly active young woman, she seems to be fit and healthy enough to be out of bed, out of danger and starting to get back to her normal life even if she isn't socially speaking supposed to be seen out of doors just yet. The baby has been born in February or thereabouts. We're told that very early in April Mr and Mrs Palmer set out from London to return to their home Cleveland in time for Easter. And this gives us another clue about when the novel is set. I've been having a look at various calendars online and I realised that this point in the novel cannot take place in 1796 because Easter was on the 27th of March that year so if they leave to go home in early April they've just missed Easter. It was a week ago. In 1797 Easter was on the 16th of April so it's possible, but early in April seems a bit early for them to be leaving. In 1798, however, Easter was on the 8th of April. So I could see why they would leave right at the beginning of the month to allow a, what turns out to be a three day journey. It would normally be two apparently, but they have extended it to probably to do with the fact that Mrs Palmer had a baby six or eight weeks earlier. All of this ultimately allows us to expand the Jennings family tree once again. I suppose if anything what that section of the video has just proved is that family trees can take you off in all directions and it's very very easy to get sidetracked and wander off down different branches but that's how family trees go. So I think that now is a good time to return to the Steel sisters. Anne, the eldest, she's nearly 30 and Lucy is aged 2 or 3 and 20. They're the ones who just happen to meet Mrs Jennings in Exeter in chapter 11 and to conveniently discover that they are related. The third cousins it would appear to Mrs Jennings daughter Lady Middleton. So the Steeles and Lady Middleton as mentioned before must share a common set of great great grandparents. The Steele sisters are willing to compliment anything and everything about Mrs Jennings, Sir John, Lady Middleton, their children, mainly I think because they are what you might call the poor relations in the story. They are 
ultimately hoping for a bit of social and financial assistance. But the Middletons are not the only relatives that Anne and Lucy Steele mention. Oh no, they are quite the name droppers. For we soon learn that Lucy Steele has been secretly engaged to Edward Ferrers, who Eleanor Dashwood is beginning to love and he feels the same towards Eleanor. Lucy has been secretly engaged to him for four years. How did they meet? Well, Edward was tutored by Lucy's uncle, Mr Pratt. Lucy acknowledges quite early on that she and Edward have different situations in life. That is, he is from a wealthier background than she is. As I mentioned in the video on the Ferris family, the Ferris are seriously wealthy people and Mrs Ferrers does use that to get something of a hold on her adult children. Edward also acknowledges at one stage Lucy's want of education, as he politely puts it, so he's implying that he has benefited from a better education than she has. Which does make sense. Lucy's uncle Mr Pratt is a tutor you might think, well, why did he not educate his niece? But maybe they were from a family where girls' education was not prioritised. It's not really very clear whether Mr Pratt is a teacher in a standalone school or if he runs a private boarding school from his home, as many people did. Jane Austen's father, the Reverend George Austen, did something similar, taking in boarding pupils. It's extra money. He was earning some extra income by teaching. But either way, Mr Pratt has to take in paying pupils. And the fact that he educates Edward implies that probably he only taught boys. But Lucy and Anne, I think, are rather mysterious people. Their hometown or village, perhaps, is not explicitly stated. But if you look closely, there are some clues. When Lucy and Anne meet Mrs Jennings in Exeter, they immediately cancel whatever plans they had there, whatever reason they had for coming to Exeter, pales into insignificance when they realise they've got the chance to uh, go back with her to Barton Park. We don't know too much about their parents, but a comment from Mrs Jennings in chapter 38 when it looks like Lucy Steele is going to marry Edward Ferrers reveals that their father is alive. They will wait a 12 month and finding no good comes of it will set down upon a curacy of £50 a year, that's very very little, with the interest of his £2,000 and what little matter Mr Steele and Mr Pratt can give her. We can reasonably infer that Mr Steele, Lucy's father, must still be alive. When you read the novel, it is sort of tempting to write Anne Steele off as a bit of a gossip, bit of a chatterbox, and somebody who frankly is obsessed with eligible beau. That is, eligible young men, male admirers, whatever you want to call them, potential boyfriends. When she's chattering away about these eligible beaux that she really quite fancies, when you start to look at the details she gives about who they are and how they are employed and how they earn their money, that I think tells you something about the Steele's social status too. When talking of her beau, Anne names a young man, Mr Rose, who is employed as a clerk in Exeter as an attractive acquaintance and potentially a good catch as a husband. It, oh, so she seems to think this man, Mr Rose, is a clerk. But he's not particularly rich, but he is literate. And later she shows a blatant interest in a certain Dr Davies who conveniently lets her and her sister Lucy share his post chaise when he travels to London. The sisters' relations in Exeter have a house whether it's rented or whether the, there's a branch of the family that's moved there is not really very clear. In Bartlett's buildings in Holborn, which did exist 
when Jane Austen was writing, but no longer does. Apparently it was destroyed in the 1941 bombings during World War II. And during their stay in London, Anne Steele relays anecdotes of some kind of little snippet of information that her cousin Richard has told her in person. The cousin Richard, she's obviously seen him recently, so I'm wondering could he actually be a member of the Exeter branch of the family that are staying at Barlett's buildings? Again, it's all very vague, but it would be a logical conclusion to draw there. Of course, no phone, no mobiles, no texts, no emails, no instant way of getting in touch. The quickest way to speak to somebody is to be near them. In chapter 49, after Edward has been disinherited, because he's engaged to Lucy, his also loyal fiancé Lucy, who couldn't do without him, disappears to marry his newly wealthy brother Robert. I've covered that bit in the Ferrers video so I'll put a link to that. What does she do? But she takes all of her sister Anne's ready cash. Anne and Lucy Steele are not wealthy people. Lucy and Robert clear off to Dawlish where she has many relations. That's interesting. So again we've got another South West England connection there. And Anne decides that she will go back to Plymouth where, again, they do seem to have some relatives. Definitely Mr Pratt, who tutored Edward, was based in Plymouth, so maybe she goes to Mr Pratt. Understanding that she hasn't really got any money, Mrs Jennings comes to Anne's rescue and she gives her a very generous five guineas, a guinea is a pound and a shilling, that would apparently get Anne at least as far as Exeter, that's covering her travelling expenses. There she plans to stay with a Mrs Burgess. Anne and Lucy Steele have got family connections to Exeter. So who's this Mrs Burgess? Is it possible that she is an aunt? Could she be their maternal uncle's wife, say? Is this all starting to tie in now? Is Cousin Richard maybe the son of Mrs Burgess? That is one way that you could look at it. It is the simplest answer I can come up with at least. On balance, when you look at all these details that seem to be drawing Anne and Lucy Steele to the Dawlish and Exeter region, the two places are only about four miles apart. I think that the family may possibly originally be from that part of the world and they just haven't moved very far from where they originated. But are these complicated scraps of information enough to make a family tree? I'm going to try. Now like family history, the Steele and Middleton and Jennings family tree and the Palmers come in as well, their relationships are quite precise at some points. We know that Mrs Jennings has two daughters, Lady Middleton and Charlotte Palmer for instance. But on the other hand, there are also some really vague connections. You know that people are related, but you're not entirely sure how. Which means that my interpretation of the family tree it might not be correct. My question now is, do you think what I have put together is correct? Or is there an alternative explanation? Either way, I would love to know. Please leave me a comment and tell me what you think. In the meantime, thank you very much for listening.